Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Orlando Museum of Arts Art Sandwiched In. I am David Madison. I am the Associate Curator of Education in Outreach here at OMA. And I have the pleasure of welcoming our speaker and introducing as well his, his uh, very talented mother. So um, our speaker today is Mr. Gary Israel. And Gary is the president of the Dorothy M. Gillespie Foundation, which is a 501c3 nonprofit whose mission is to support, develop, and encourage the talents of young and emerging female artists in the United States. As president of the foundation, he travels around the country meeting with museum directors and curators, university administrators, city officials, gallery owners, and collectors to share his plans for preserving Dorothy Gillespie's art and legacy. He is also director of the Gary Israel Morris Robotics Foundation, which is a 501c3 nonprofit whose mission is to promote interest and careers in science, technology, engineering, arts, mathematics, business, leadership, and entrepreneurship to youth in the schools in the South Bronx and Harlem, New York, particularly those of lower income, at risk, and or minority backgrounds through participation in team-based robotics programs. For the past 22 years, his robotics program has been supported by the New York Yankees. And each year, he and his students are honored on the field at Yankee Stadium during a pregame ceremony. And of course, Gary's mother is the artist Dorothy Gillespie, who lived an unconventional and truly pathbreaking life as an artist, a painter, sculptor, pioneer, activist, and mentor, writer, educator, and lecturer. And today, her large volume of work is housed in museums, public spaces, and private collections throughout the United States and abroad. During this centennial year of her birth, the uh, Dorothy M. Gillespie uh, Foundation has worked to paint a rich portrait of Gillespie and her world. Her life story continues to offer inspiration to female artists today by asking them to revisit and reimagine what it means for women to be successful artists on their own terms. So please help me virtually welcome um, Mr. Carrie Israel. Well, thank you, David. I want to thank the Orlando Museum of Art for inviting me to talk about my mother and her amazing, extraordinary life, especially this year, her 100th birthday, her centennial. Uh, of course, I want to invite and uh, thank all my friends from around the country joining me, especially the ones in the Northeast that are being hit by the snowstorm. It's only 74 degrees here, but we won't go there. Uh, anyway, I'm here in the library and to my left, I'm going off script a little, David, I hope you don't mind, but I happened to spend a couple minutes walking around the library here and I noticed uh, several books, of course, Michelangelo, Suzanne, uh, Picasso, and um, my mother just adored, of course, all those artists. And, um, and I wanna share an email that I received about Picasso, because right to the left of my mother is uh, a Picasso book. And this person said, Picasso, she was talking about my mother. She was like a Picasso. She did paintings, drawings, and portraits. And that's what Picasso did. Picasso then opened up with creativity. Your mother opened up with creativity with an explosion of vibrancy. And when you saw Dorothy Gillespie, you saw a unique, you saw a passion and it was consistent. There was no deviating from it. And one was more successful than the other. And it brought joy. And that to me is the definition of an artist. So the universe acts in strange ways. And uh, again, I thank the Orlando Museum for inviting me uh, to talk about my mother. And I think what we'll do now, David, is we'll show the, um, the video of it's um, a compilation of four half hour documentaries. And I think you'll enjoy it. I hope you will. And after the 12 minute video, I'll talk about my mother's role in the movement.
well, my, my work is, is uh, all from childhood. Bouncing balls, uh, uh, the uh, uh, tops, spinning tops. You've never seen before a, a top being, being kind of pumped and then it goes around and then it slows down and then you see the colors are separate and the, uh, everything. And uh, so all that awareness, I was very aware of it. That what I had seen, I had never seen before. It's very exciting. And my childhood was in Roanoke. And I, I think Roanoke is a beautiful city. It's nestled in the mountains. I remember distinctly a bouncing ball when I was a little kid and I would bounce the ball and it would turn and it had all those stars on it and those stripes and things and it was all those colors and that magic of those colors was absolutely fascinating to me. Those are the kind of things that I try to get, that magic that, that things had for me as a child. What, what's the old saying that you, that you, all children make wonderful art. They just don't have the knowledge to repeat it. And that is what it takes to be an artist, to repeat a certain quality and a, you know, a child will do a beautiful, wonderful finger painting and the next one will be just terrible and they will never be able to do one as good as that. So that's what art is. And I suppose that I want the abandon that a child has with the knowledge that an adult has to have. That's why I work with aluminum. I'm a woman, I don't have as much strength as, as a man has. I think it would be stupid for me to work with a material that I can't control that I can't work with, that I, that's too heavy for me to move. Those are barriers that I say that we put up for ourselves. I suppose that some kind of, uh, that an artist in painting, of, the way you scan, your eye scans a painting, when the artist is painting it, he, he or she sees all these things happening in it. And I suppose that at some point I saw, wouldn't it be nice if this came really came out instead of illusion. That's basically the difference between sculpture and painting is one's an illusion of something and, and the other is, is an, becomes an ap actual object. I, I, I think it's very interesting that I'm right in the middle of it. I, I'm, I'm right. But I wanted basically, I think, more participation. I, I like the fact that people can become involved with my, my with my work during the 60s uh, after I had done some canvases that came off the wall they actually were canvases that you could walk around and in between I still have them by the way I, I remember Elaine de Kooning once saying that she had worked on these big columns and she said I still have them after all these years nobody ever bought them <laughs> nobody ever bought these and I'm, I'm glad because it's nice to have them they take up a lot of room but but they were my first uh, uh, canvases coming off the wall. Uh, it was a, a daring leap when I started putting things on, uh, on uh, a background. On a, I would paint the background and then, and that had to work as painting, and then I would cut up pieces and attach them to the, this background. And uh, so uh, it kind of looks like peel paint. <laughs> And, uh, but it's, uh, uh, I, it, to me, it was a natural progression. There are certain things that weren't a natural, uh, that aren't a natural progression. For instance, I don't think it's a natural progression to paint totally abstract, totally abstract. And, and when I first started painting abstract, there were things that would appear and I would take them out because I wanted it to be totally abstract. So I'm still able to do that with the shapes of the metal attached to other things. I kind of a symbol, so it, I'm, I, I guess I would have to say that I'm, a, I, a, uh, I'm involved with collage and assemblage, and uh, I love color, so I, I have to paint, and I like dimension, so, I, so I'm, I, uh, I do a little bit of everything. I think I come more from being a painter than, than I, I think I think more like a painter than I do a sculptor. Frank Holt said to me in Orlando 
that he thought there was a project that my work would be perfect for. And we met down there to look at it. And I told him, when I saw the project, I told him that it's an impossible project. It's an enormous piece, but it's viewed nine feet away. Everywhere it's viewed nine feet away because it's in the well of a, uh, uh, of a helix. Helix, I guess that's what they call it. Double helix, yes, it's a double helix because the cars go up and down. And, or you can walk up if you want to. And uh, uh, so you view it nine, ten feet away. It's like a museum, seeing a piece in a museum. Except it's this, this enormous thing. So it's not a case of doing big, big uh, splashes of color that are five or six feet big. This has to have detail in it because you're actually seeing it as if you were seeing a painting on a wall, a painting or a piece of sculpture, a wall relief. It was, it was the most enormous project I've ever known a painter who paints with a brush to, ever, to undertake in my lifetime. I believe that the, uh, the building was so pure with glass, glass, uh, you know, you walked on glass. If you remember walking across those bridges, that was glass that you were walking on. And it was frosted, but it, you could see light through it. Uh, and they had all these bridges that were, of course, wonderful and made it perfect for my, my work because you could see the work from every angle. I had them on fishing line, 50 feet long. And I devised a way to, to tie them so that each one of them turned individually. So there were over 300 pieces in that thing. I'm doing one now for the uh, Boca Raton Museum that will be part inside and part outside. And uh, uh, so that's a, that's a challenge in itself because uh, it's really two different pieces, but it would be made to look like one piece. what New York has that, I, that is essential to me. And I know this from having studios. Uh, I, I had a studio in Hollywood, Florida. I've had a studio in Dallas, Texas. Uh, but I always had the studio in New York. New York is the source. It's the energy that somehow or another relates to me and my work. And uh, so I, uh, I don't think that I could live out of New York and be pr as productive as I am. I don't think so. I find myself, you know, after a couple of weeks, well, I watch a little bit of television in the morning. In, in New York, I'm in my studio with no television, no nothing, by 6 o'clock every morning. And when I'm out of New York, well, it's all right. I can get there 15 minutes later or something. Not New York. New York is a demanding place. New York demands excellence. It demands that you do the best you can. Rockefeller Center was the most exciting thing I have ever done. And the first day that I, I toured the space, 
uh, they said to me, you can put things on the wall. And I looked at them, I was shocked that they would say that. And I said, but these are hallowed grounds. <laughs> and they said, I know, but you can put things on the wall. You can. And uh, it, I realized that they were trusting me. I could do whatever I wanted. So it made me have restraints in what I was doing. I wanted to make it work with a very important building. Rockefeller Center is pure, pure Art Deco. And I didn't try to cover that up. I just worked with it. And I decided that much of the work would be on anodized aluminum because that looks gold. And, it, and, and it's made for outdoors, so it's not going to turn, it's not going to change. And uh, I probably wouldn't have said that I would do something if I knew how high they were. Those panels that were on the walls, one of them was 22 feet. And, and I had to make those in my, paint those in my studio. Uh, things come to me. I let them come. You know what I say, I'm not smart enough to know what's really I should be doing, so I do it all. <laughs> and that way, uh, 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 doors open, doors open that I never imagined would open. You know, uh, Joseph Campbell, the wonderful Joseph Campbell who taught at Vassar for 47 years or something, uh, says in his books and in his, that he calls it bliss. If you follow your bliss, doors will open that you never knew existed. And I think that's true. Well, I remember that show, 2003. My mother was 83 years old and she loved to drive people around and, and show Rockefeller Center. She was fearless. And it's a good segue uh, to, the, to the women's movement uh, that my mother was quite active in. Um, although the women's movement began in the 1970s, my mother in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s demonstrated how a woman could live a complex life as an artist, mother, wife, public figure, and educator in a time when social expectations often confined women's horizons. You could say she was well prepared to be part of the women's movement. Actually, the seeds for her involvement were planted in 1938. Here she is at, in Baltimore at the Maryland Institute College of Art. She decided to be an artist, not to go the way of, of many women, which was to go to art school or go to school and be an art teacher. Not my mother, she was very independent. And in 1943, she moved, she moved to New York, met my father. Three years later, they got married. And that was the year I truly be be, uh, believe that she became a feminist. And if you look at this self-portrait that she did in 1946, the year she got married, you'll see in the lower right side that uh, it was signed Gillespie Israel. And of course she was proud because she just got married and she wanted to sign her work uh, with my father's name. But that was the year she decided why should she give my father or any one credit if she's producing the art. So after that year, I've never found anything that was signed with my father's name. It was just strictly Gillespie. And her advice to young artists is always use your name, never take your husband's name. So she was quite independent. Um, in, in a paper titled Dorothy Gillespie and the Women's Movement, um, by the way, on the right is Louise Nevelson, uh, Marcia Corbino, a writer, journalist, theater and arts critic and playwright quotes my mother as saying, quote, 
the women's movement was an exhilarating time as we broke down barriers in the art world. According to Ms. Corbino, Gillespie worked vigorously during the early years of the women's movement, attending meetings, planning strategy, and offering inspiration. She passionately championed political action, high aesthetic standards, and education as goals for women. She was also on the picket line in 1970 when women in the arts and other feminist groups protested at the Whitney Museum of American Art, demanding that the museum choose more women artists for their annual exhibitions. During the 1970s, my mother became closely associated with the Women's Inter Art Center in New York City. The WIC was begun in 1970 by visual artists and actors who felt an alternate space could serve both expressions. My mother's work was chosen to open their new gallery in 1972 and to celebrate their 10th anniversary, anniversary in 1981. She was named artist in residence that year, that same year. From 1973 to 1977, she was co-coordinator of the center. One of her first tasks was the creation of a woman artist historical archives. She conducted interviews with both well-known and lesser, lesser known women who had made art their life work. According to my mother, it seemed essential to establish a central resource of this kind, but it was a question of attitude as well. Just as each artist's work is unique, so is each artist's life unique. Quote, I never asked a woman artist anything I would not ask a man. In 1972, she was asked to originate a course that would enlighten and educate women in the visual arts at the New School for Social Research in New York City. The intent of this pioneering class functioning in the art world was to prepare women for a new, more aggressive role in the world. From 1977 to 1983, my mother was the director of the Art and Community Institute at the New School. In 1974, Joyce Weinstein and my mother organized a new group called New York Professional Women Artists. Members lectured at universities and wrote articles to encourage women artists. That year, my mother organized an innovative outdoor exhibition through the helpful funds of the Public Art Council titled Walk Through Art, which consisted of 12 walk-through triangles each triangle expressed the individual artist's style, transformed from canvas paintings and a mixed media pieces to three-sided internal and external paintings summed up to a triangle. Each triangle was opened to walk through or sit or meditate in. The exhibition was mounted in Central Park, Battery Park, and traveled to 50 colleges, university, and street fairs throughout the country. In the 1970s, my mother published a number of articles such as Professionalism and the Women Artist, another article, Overcoming Barriers, Special Problems of the Women Artists in the South was published in the Southern Quarterly. In 2001, my mother received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Women's Caucus for the Arts for her work, vision, and commitment to women in the visual arts. The WCA supports women artists, art historians, students, educators, and museum professionals. Other artist recipients of the award include George O'Keefe, Louise Nevelson, Alice Neal, Isabel Bishop, Audrey Flack, and many other well-respected artists. The citation reads in part, quote, we honor you, Dorothy Gillespie, for your pioneering efforts on behalf of women in the arts. You have shown women how to function in the art world how to invest in themselves, how to balance life and work, and how to do these seemingly incompatible tasks with joy and with the generosity of spirit. My mother became a role model for feminists because she seemed to have it all, a successful career, a happy marriage with children, and a sense of outrage at the inequalities endured by women artists. For the past eight years, I've had the pleasure of traveling around the country visiting over 30 universities and talking to many young female artists and learning about their own art. Uh, here in, in Orlando, I had the opportunity to meet Mar Martinez, 
a BFA student who recently graduated from UCF. Um, UCF should be very proud of this young lady. And I want to share part of an email she sent me. Talking with you and learning about Dorothy's path was very encouraging. Everyone chooses their different way in life, but in art, it never seems to be a direct route. It's helpful to hear about how artists I admire accomplish their goals. Thank you for taking time to share it with me. Well, this past Monday, I'm here in Orlando for a few days. I had an opportunity to have coffee with her again. And she, of course, was excited. She had just graduated. And I asked her what she would be doing. And it just was amazing how many things she's planning to do in the future. And I was thinking that my mother at that age, uh, coming to New York City in 1943, the similarities between the two of them and how my mother's legacy has been so inspiring for young artists, uh, which brings me to the foundation and how it's preserving the legacy of my mother's art. Uh, when she passed away, she left two studios, lots of art, hundreds, maybe thousands of pieces of art, but more importantly, she left the Dorothy M. Gillespie Foundation. And the mission of that foundation is to, of course, support artists, initiatives, and institutions that embody the same innovative, inclusive, multidisciplinary approach that Dorothy Gillespie exemplified in both her art and philanthropic endeavors. As you can see, the list of educational grants that I give out each year to museums uh, around the country, art scholarships. Uh, my mother traveled to many universities around the uh, country, so I've established 13 art scholarships uh, around the country. Each summer, there's an art studio residency uh, available for college students to spend two to three weeks up in uh, Narrowsburg, New York. It's in the Catskills. Something that was very important for my mother was public art. Uh, she loved museums and she has, of course, lots of art and museums around the country, but she felt it was very important for the public to see art and in many cases not to have to pay for it. So one of the things I do as I travel around the country is I locate places to place my art, my mother's art to donate, especially hospitals. Uh, one of the first places I uh, placed art was here in uh, Orlando at Orlando Health right after the Pulse shooting. I wanted to um, you know, honor the, uh, the people in the hospital that had, had done such amazing work. So uh, I'm very proud of what the foundation is doing with, um, with the art because art should be seen. What to do with my mother's papers? Well, there were a lot of them, 24 cartons. So the Dorothy M. Gillespie Foundation donated those cartons, uh, newspaper articles, catalogs, press releases, artist statements, personal letters, professional correspondence, magazines, journals, photographs, slides. Uh, Rutgers University has those. And last year I gave a small grant for two students to digitize them, to start digitizing them so they could be uh, viewed all around the world. Four years ago, the foundation established an art scholarship here in Orlando at UCF, University of Central Florida. And during one of my visits to UCF, I had the opportunity to meet the first recipient of the DMG, or the M. Gillespie Scholarship at UCF, uh, which is always a treat to um, meet these young art students and, and see their art and hear what their future is. During one of my visits to UCF, I had the opportunity to meet the first, um, uh, last, I'm sorry, last year while on the UCF campus, I have had the pleasure of visiting Limitless Solutions. Funded, founded in 2014 by then UCF students, the team is dedicated to empowering children in the limb difference community. Limbitless creates personalized, creative, and expressive 3D printed bionic arms and believes that no family should be financially burdened because their child has a limb difference. I was so impressed with what I saw 
that I had established a scholarship for a talented sculpture artist on the Limitless Solution team. This now makes two UCF art scholarships awarded each year. Yesterday, I had an opportunity to tour their new building. They're going from 1,800 square feet to over 5,000 square feet. I met with Albert Monero, the president, founder of Limitless, and I also got to meet the current recipient of the Dorothy M. Gillespie Scholarship. So that was a thrill for me. Uh, always a thrill to meet young artists. Uh, I wanna share a comment from a UCF art student and UCF should be so proud of all the students here on campus. Uh, this is one of the largest campuses in the country, over 70,000 students and they're doing amazing work. This student wrote to me and said, the Dorothy Gillespie scholarship is an impactful way to honor your mother. Funding is important because it allows people to be able to share their work with the world scholarships for female students are so important because it inspires and encourages young women to believe in their work and push themselves towards academic and artistic excellence the arts are notoriously underfunded especially in the state of florida as a student and an artist myself i'd like to personally thank you for supporting the arts financially foundations like yours keep the arts alive I've been so impressed here in Orlando at the University of Central Florida, meeting students, faculty, and staff, that today I'm announcing a partnership between the Dorothy M. Gillespie Foundation and the University of Central Florida, where eventually the school will store, preserve, and create, curate the Gillespie art collection, total art collection, while administering a sponsorship program ensuring the means to do so in perpetuity. Um, in the spring of 2021, more details will uh, be told during the US UCF celebrates the art. The first piece that I donated over the summer, this will be the first of many, many more donations to UCF is located in the downtown communication and media building, which houses the Nicholson School Communication and Media. And they have a beautiful signage. And what is important about this signage, and I really uh, have to thank UCF for that, this signage, is that it has a photo of, of my mother. Why is that important? Because without the photo, many people men especially, even maybe children, assume that a piece like this could not be done by a, a woman. And, and so it always attracts attention when you have a signage with a photo of the artist. So I, I thank them for that. I have another announcement to make today. The Dorothy Gillespie Foundation is collaborating with Bob and Cheryl Schwartz, filmmakers from Motiva Consensus, on a two-year film project titled Discovering Dorothy Gillespie. Bob and Cheryl will travel around the country interviewing friends, artists, collectors, museum officials, university administrators, public art officials, and others to paint a rich portrait of Dorothy Gillespie and her world. What I'm really excited about is that they're going to be interviewing students. Mar Martinez will be interviewed, uh, the student recipient of the scholarship uh, at Limitless, and students that have used my mother's um, inspiration, that have been inspired by mother, my mother to do their senior paper. So you'll hear more about this film. Um, it should be finished in 2022. Um, so I'm looking forward to uh, hopefully premiering it here in Orlando at the WUCF PBS station. So stay tuned, literally stay tuned. So that's, that's it. Um, she had an extraordinary life. We're celebrating it. Thank you. Um, to learn more about the foundation, you can certainly contact me, uh, go to my mother's website, 
And, um, and again, I want to thank David and the museum for inviting me. And I did bring some little sculptures in that I'd like to share with you. These are from my private collection. Uh, the collect the um, UCF collection of small sculptures will be in the hundreds. And uh, I announced when I met with the UCF officials that next September, there's going to be an, uh, an exhibition of my mother's small sculptures. And eventually UCF will, will have those small sculptures and they'll travel all around the country. So uh, are we ready to show them, David? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, there's a, a variety of them. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that my mother did these small sculptures. They think of her as doing these large ones. But uh, when she had shows at, in museums, the museums always like to have um, in their gift shop sculptures, little sculptures that, that could be purchased. So the, this is just from my private collection. And um, as you can see, a lot of this is labor intensive, even the small ones. And you would see my mother's hands, if you ever saw them, how strong they were because she would cut the metal. First, she would paint the metal, the aluminum. And in the film, you heard aluminum is, it was her medium of choice. And uh, paint it flat, cut it, and then bend it with her hands. And I, I thought, uh, I mentioned to David, this museum, by the way, is gorgeous. I love Orlando Museum of Art. You walk in and you see a Dale Chihuly. And every time I hear a Dale Chihuly um, reference, I think of what people say about my mother's art. Dale Chihuly is to glass as Dorothy Gillespie is to metal. And I remember meeting a museum director once and, and she said to me, you know, Dale Chihuly was influenced by your mother. And I looked at her and I said, oh, you mean the other way around? And she said, no, your mother has been doing this way before Dale Chihuly has been doing it. And I, I thought that was, that was a nice compliment to be compared to Dale Chihuly. And I'm, I'm really excited that uh, for 2021, all the events that we have planned, I'll be making an announcement in January that the Philadelphia Flower Show has invited me to exhibit my mother's art uh, from the Rockefeller Center that you saw in the film. That's gonna be at the Flower Show in Philadelphia. And this will be the first year that it's going to be outdoors because of COVID, it had to be canceled last spring, it was indoors the convention center. And so this year they're gonna have it outside and they want to highlight the Dorothy Gillespie sculptures, the totem um, the sculptures that will go in the garden, and the, uh, the starburst that will be hanging. Uh, so I'm really excited about that. 250,000 people view it each year. And after that, after the Philadelphia Flower Show, I will be getting into a 26 foot truck and transporting them down to Central Florida, uh, Castleberry, Florida here, not far from Orlando. We'll be having a show of the Rockefeller Center outdoor pieces. So I'm really excited. Central Florida is a big part of my mother's legacy. It was a big part of her life. She worked uh, with Epcot um, and she had lots of friends here. So it makes perfect sense to have this partnership between UCF, Orlando, Central Florida, and the foundation. So again, David, thank you so much. And I know my mother would be thrilled to have her art here displayed in the museum. Well, thank you so much. That was a fantastic presentation. And I'm so happy you brought the sculptures. I know we're, we're viewing them virtually, but there's nothing quite like seeing um, a sculpture kind of in person, right? It, it, there's there's no real way to capture that, but um, hopefully by, by sharing them with the camera, uh, you all got a taste of, of the beauty of Dorothy Gillespie's 
work um, and craftsmanship. And, you know, uh, if anyone has a question for Gary, I encourage you to type those into the Q&A uh, feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And I have a question for you, Gary, as you know, this is a unique situation in the sense that you're the son of an artist and we traditionally hear directly from artists. So um, I'd like to hear a bit more about what it was like to have a mother as as an artist, what what that was like growing up um, for you. Well, you saw a newspaper article in one of the slides, and I remember that because it was in the 1950s. I was born in 49, and so I, I was a kid, uh, and I was so proud because I remember um, my mother being on TV, and I remember uh, the photographers coming to the house, and I would they'd have a shoot of my mother, then they would take photos of the kids. But it was so, she was so different than all my friend's mother. You know, they were baking brownies, cookies, and my mother was traveling around the world. But when it was important, she would come into my class in elementary school and uh, talk about her art. And it was, it was really, uh, I couldn't have been more proud and I'm probably even more proud now that I, I know more about her and this film that's coming out will really, and that's why it's discovering Dorothy Gillespie because I didn't know the whole story about my mother until I started this journey. But it was, it, it's been a, an amazing, um, the fact that 1943 she came to New York and married my father three years later, and then three years from then had me, that was very unusual back in the 40s for women artists to get married or to marry a non-artist, my father, and then to have two children in her 20s, in the 1940s, said a lot about her. Mm. That really says about her. So as I learn more and share those stories with, with people, I think people have a, a different picture of who she was. Great, uh, thank you. We have a few questions from people watching right now. Um, one of the first is, uh, did you mention, uh, someone has apologized for, she missed the first few minutes and she was wondering, and I don't think you did, but did you mention the recent article that you shared via email about the club that your parents owned in New York City and its influence on artists? It was so fascinating, um, this, this viewer yeah. says. You know, I, I, I tell the story that if you take my mother's children away from her, the three children, doesn't have children, if you take away her art career, she and my father lived this amazing story, of this life in the 40s. They owned a nightclub. Actually, my father owned a bar when my mother uh, moved. The first day she moved to New York in 1943, she met my father the first day. She had an apartment in the on the fifth floor and the bar was on the first floor and that's how they became friends. Three years later, they got married and they opened up a nightclub, a French nightclub called Salle de Champagne, Champagne Room. And after my mother died and I went through all her archives, I found all these newspaper articles and photos of the nightclub and the celebrities that attended it. And what just was so amazing was to see these photos of the nightclub in newspapers and to see my mother's artwork on the wall and to see my father's photo, which I, I still have, and my mother's self uh, portraits. Uh, here she is 26 and, and she is the hostess of a nightclub, a famous nightclub. It was the Sardis of Greenwich Village. And if you see the pictures of, of the people, the way the people dressed, women wore dresses, men were in suits. And by the way, just a side note, uh, that's what attracted my uh, father to my mother. When he met her the first day, he said, I'd never seen anyone dress the way your mother dressed because she wore jeans and, and basically sandals. So it was an extraordinary life uh, back then that they lived and uh, she was able to paint during the day and at night entertain, be the hostess of a nightclub. So yeah, that's a great story. And I'm learning more and more because as I, as I share that with people, um, I have someone who actually was a teenager in the nightclub. I was only two 
<laughs> so <laughs> I, was, I was born in 49. So, but I was two years old in 51 when, when it was suddenly closed, but that's another chapter. Um, but yeah, it was sure. a time for, for them. And I think all of these experiences that my mother had uh, affected her art. Was it? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I loved, so we met on, um, on Monday and we were talking and it was, it, you were just able to list off so many very important names. I mean, it was such a network of artists that Dorothy was a part of. And so I think that's so important. Well, I, I yes. And I think it grounded her, um, mm. in terms of fame and fortune. Uh, my mother had many opportunities to be famous, uh, fame, whatever that is, you know, she didn't care for that word fame. Um, back in Rockefeller Center, she had a wonderful opportunity. And um, I learned a lesson, you always ask for forgiveness, don't ask permission. That's from your parent. I was old enough and I asked my mother for permission to go to the Today Show. She had just finished that installation with Rockefeller Center. And I wanted to show it, I wanted the world to see it. And uh, I said, Mom, I'm going to go over to the Today Show, 30 Rock, and I'm going to invite the producer to come over. They're going to interview you. You're 83 years old. You've got the, all this colorful sculpture here in the Channel Gardens in Rockefeller Center, one of the most famous places in the world. And she cursed me out. And she says, <laughs> blank, blank, because I don't know if I can say those words, artists don't promote themselves. Hmm. Well, after she passed away, of course, I learned artists have to promote themselves, but she was from the old Absolutely. school. You don't do that. You let your art promote yourself. So, um, yeah, hmm. there were many opportunities if she wanted to be famous. She knew all the art, famous artists, Lee Krasner, Jackson Pollock, could have bought his work, didn't like his work, didn't like him. Mom. <laughs> would have been very happy if you had bought his work, even if you didn't like it. So <laughs> she had her beliefs and, and she stuck by them, you know, so that that's an inspiration to me uh, as mm -hmm. I take on this, quote, burden of all her art that, um, you know, she was able to, to do it so I can do it. So since you mentioned the Rockefeller Center um, installation, how long was that? did that take her to, to create? Stephen is asking um, how long that display was in the making. Six, it took her six months uh, to do. And uh, I'm so happy that one of the uh, young men who was being interviewed for the film was on my robotics team and my mother needed help, assistance, and she had assistance, but to move things and so he helped her and it was six months in the making uh unfortunately it wasn't displayed as long as it was supposed to be because this was right after 9 11 um you know 2003 and there was a credible um warning that a terrorist was going to use the channel garden um unfortunately as it's right across from um saint patrick's cathedral so uh, it only was up for a couple months, mm. but it, it was, I, I remember, uh, you talk about pride. I remember uh, I would go there all the time and people would comment and I'd say, you know who the artist is? Um, and, uh, they said, no, I said, well, that's my mother. Um, hmm. I remember Robert Wagner and Jill St. John were walking there. You see celebrities all the time. And what, what my mother loved about New York city is that she could be anonymous. And that was very important because she didn't want to be recognized uh, in small towns you recognize. Well, Robert Wagner, Jill St. John, they're just walking, looking at my mother's art. No one's coming up to them asking for autographs. And I said, would you like to meet the artist? Um, she's my mother. And so I introduced them and they just love the art as everyone. So yeah, there was a lot of pride for me personally with that show. Great. Um, and since we've spoken a bit about your family dynamics, uh, Mark is also asking if your father was an influence for Dorothy. It sounds like they were involved in the, in the club operation, but how was he an influence for her? Yes, yes. In fact, um, a quick story, huh? No, no stories that I tell are quick. 
oxymoron. But um, towards the end of my mother's life, I, I said, Mom, do you ever regret marrying Dad? Now, remember, he was a nightclub owner. Uh, he played the clarinet. He played in the band, uh, in the Catskills. And I said, Mom, you know, all the young women artists in the, tw in the 40s, your age, were marrying a male artist to get ahead because back then it was really tough. So Lee Krasner, Jackson Pollock, my mother was very friendly with Lee Krasner. And she said to me, she says, I don't regret marrying your dad. Uh, I wanted to be known for what I did, not because of my husband, who was the artist. So she said he was able to take you and your brother and sister to the park, to the music, uh, to the uh, to the beach, to the movies, so that I could create my art. So yeah, he he did have an influence on her, so that she was able to be in the studio, and my father, who would work at night, was able to take care of the kids. He was Mr. Mom. Hmm. <laughs> Love that. So there was a real reverse of gender roles in your in your household. Why <laughs> well, there could be a, a movie about about them? I mean, I remember on Sunday my mother would have these salons, and I didn't understand at the time. And now I, I realize. And she she did a radio program, uh, and she she was a filmmaker in the '60s. She she shot film. She did everything. Uh, and so when I look at the sculptures here and I think, oh, she, no, no, there's more to it. Whenever I'm invited to a collector's home and I, I go over to the piece, which is usually a large piece in this huge home, and I go over to the signature and I, I ask the person, do you know who this woman is? And oh, yes, I went to her studio and I, I met her in a gallery exhibition, but they don't know. No one knows because that's not who she was. Uh, she never said anything about what she did yesterday and certainly never about the, the gallery, the, the nightclub. That was just not important to anyone. That was the past. My mother was very future oriented and always talking about the present and the future and not the past. So that's what I'm doing. I'm sort of gathering all this evidence for an oral history project, a book, and of course, collaborating with the filmmakers. Wonderful. And uh, we do, if you're up for a few more questions, <laughs> we, uh, okay. um, I'm going to combine one. So there is a question uh, going back to that kind of network. And I love this, these salons that she was hosting. Um, there's a specific question about whether or not she knew Hans Hoffman or Robert Motherwell. And then there's another question uh, related to that. And uh, did she collect other artists? works and was your home just filled with some of these great kind of modern artists uh, so well yes yes and yes um and that's that's why i mean louise nevelson she used to trade art with louise nevelson and she used to tell these stories about because my mother did a lot of these conferences so um elaine de kooning uh actually i have a sketchbook from them that she gave uh, my mother and i i looked wow. through sketchbook and I go wow it was done in Paris and uh, just yeah she knew the knew them all and and she she did horoscopes she read palms um, she had all these celebrities that would come over and it just extraordinary um, life that I'm learning learning about her and uh, so yeah there's a private collection that I will be displaying next fall of art that Dorothy Gillespie collects. So it's 55 pieces of other artists that my mother collected like Louise Nevelson, Lee Krasner, other artists. And what's important about that is that it shows how, how she supported other artists. And back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, you had to do that because they weren't being purchased by galleries. And, and so you had to show your support. And so it was very important. So in this exhibition, you'll be able to read little stories about each artist and why it was important to my mother. Oh, I love that. And where is that show going to be? Well, it's going to be in Virginia. And okay. then after that, it's going to travel around the country. And eventually it will be part uh, of UCF down 
you know, next 10, 15 years, as we talk about this relationship with the University of Central Florida, it will be part of their collection and it will continue uh, long after I'm gone. And um, so, yeah, I'm excited about the continuation of my mother's foundation. UCF is excited about doing that and her legacy and, and just uh, we're exploring all possibilities here. Wonderful. Uh, and specifically to Central Florida, do you have any plans for um, an exhibition maybe of, of her work or uh, there is a question, Celestial Joy is still on view, correct? That one is still up? Yes. Yeah. I was at the Dr. Phillips of Pouring Arts Center yesterday, and for those people that do not live here in Orlando, it is one of the most extraordinary places I've ever been to. And growing up in Manhattan, you know, the Metropolitan Opera and all, the, the, the architecture is just amazing. And we're looking, we're exploring uh, opportunities to display art there. So Central Florida is very important. As I said, Castleberry is gonna have a show of the art uh, from the Rockefeller Center. Maitland Art Center has work of my mother's. Lou Garden just had work. Um, I just uh, deinstalled some artwork there. So yeah, Central Florida. So definitely some plans. <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, we're looking for the next 50, 100 years. That's, that's a true legacy. And, and what I'm excited about, and I don't wanna go into detail with UCF partnership because uh, it's going to be um, announced and the hype will be fantastic, is uh, that UCF sees such exciting possibilities of, of having musicians go around the country on loan from UCF. Mm -hmm. That's what it's yeah. As a as I've shared with you as a doctoral student at UCF, I am just so excited about the potential and, and seeing that collection grow and, and her archive being um, open to researchers at the university. So yes, I think that's an incredible partnership. I'm so happy you you announced that today. Yeah, and I'm I'm returning to Orlando in uh, January to meet with people from Orlando Health. Uh, Orlando Health, of course, has an amazing partnership with Orlando and with UCF, and now with the Dorothy M. Gillespie Foundation, they have looked at art that they want to display in hospitals all around the Central Florida area. And as I mentioned before, it's uplifting in hospitals. I, I donated some art, um, Starburst, to a children's hospital in the South Bronx, and to see the joy yeah. that it gives children see those starbursts they look like explosions you know uh, yeah there's so like i said to you earlier there's so much whimsy in her work which i love and it, it's attractive to me and i can see that being attractive to younger viewers as well that joy that we receive through the through her sense of colors and through her her just beautiful forms that she was able to sculpt with this aluminum um so yes i'm so excited to see to see more of her work um, and, and and watch as this project continues to develop I do want to end on one last question, uh, and it's from Karen. So what do you think your mother would say to you about all of the work you have been doing to preserve her legacy um, over the past eight plus years? Um, could you spell that, that word? Is that my daughter who just... <laughs> Karen? <laughs> e or an A? It's an E. That's my daughter. Okay. <laughs> That's her grandmother. That's her grandmother. As I said, being here in this library, um, being surrounded by all these artists' book, having my mother's sculpture here, uh, seeing it being displayed everywhere around the country. Um, would she be proud of what I'm doing? Uh, not for herself and her legacy. She would be proud uh, that it inspires young artists uh, like Mar Martinez, that would really make her smile to know that back in 1943, when she was 23 years old, 60 years later, she had the show at Rockefeller Center and 77 years today on her 100th birthday. Um, it was 77 years ago that she came to New York as a struggling artist and worked her way, uh, you know, jobs and then uh, has this amazing career that just 
I don't know where it's going to end, but I'm, I'm sure she's, if she's looking down, or I do tell people if she's looking up, but uh, that's just because she would be checking out the colors downstairs to see. <laughs> <laughs> would be very, very happy with what's going on here with Orlando, Central Florida, UCF. Yes. Absolutely. Well, Gary, thank you so much for sharing your mother's stunning work, her legacy um, with us here at the Orlando Museum of Art, but with the nation, uh, nationwide, all the work that you're doing. So thank you for today um, and the future. And thank you to everyone who has watched this webinar. We are going to uh, publish the recording to our OMA Education YouTube account. So a link to that will be sent to you um, later on. So thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Thank you.